I'm Manik Varma from Microsoft Research India and IIT Delhi. And I'll be talking about the extremes of machine learning, where today I'll be focusing on machine learning problems at the extremely large and extremely small scales. So let me start by discussing extreme classification, which is a new research area in machine learning that we started in 2013, and which has also opened up a new paradigm for thinking about key applications in our industry, such as ranking and recommendation. This is joint work with my PhD students at IIT Delhi, Himanshu Jain, Yashoteja Prabhu and Kunal Dahiya, as well as with my colleagues at Microsoft, Rahul Agarwal, Shrutendra Harsola and Anil Kag. Now some of you might not have heard the term extreme classification before, so let me start by giving some context. The most widely studied problem in the history of machine learning is binary classification, where we learn to answer yes-no questions involving uncertainty such as, is this an image of George Washington or not? Now, many of the uh, machine learning problems that we need to deal with in real world applications fall in this area. So for instance, if I'm um, going to be logging into my device using face recognition, you might want to predict, am I the real user or not? Or um, we might want to predict, did I just say the words, hey Cortana or not, or hey Siri or not? And we might want to predict whether this a file that I'm going to open, is it been infected with an unknown virus or not? Or is this email spam or not? Okay. After a while though, the machine learning community came to the realization that many questions in the real world are actually multiple choice and not just binary. This led to the establishment of the area of multi-class classification, where we learn to answer multiple choice questions involving uncertainty, such as which US president is present in this image. So you might be given a list of 44 or 45 choices corresponding to all the US presidents, and you have to pick one choice from that list that corresponds to the correct answer, which in this case is George Washington. Okay. And many real world applications of machine learning also fall in this area. Right? So for instance, if I were writing with a stylus, we might want to predict which of the 26 English characters did I just write. Or if I was playing on the Xbox, we might want to predict which gesture did I just perform. Or we might want to predict which is the which object is present in the foreground of this particular image. Okay. The next step in the evolution of classification came when the machine learning community realized that for some high impact uh, applications, the questions are not only multiple choice, but they also have multiple correct answers. So this led to the establishment of the area of multi-label classification, where we learn to pick the relevant subset of choices in a multiple choice question. So for instance, we might ask which US presidents are present in this image. And so you might have the same list of 44 or 45 choices that you had earlier in the multi-class case, but now you have to pick all the choices that are relevant. right? And over here, there are exactly four correct answers, Washington, Jefferson, Roosevelt, and Link. So as you can see, multi-label classification is a much harder problem than multi-class classification. And in terms of real world applications, if you want to identify what are the set of topics that are being discussed in an article, then this becomes a multi-label problem. Because the article could be about news, but it could also be about sport, and it could also be about entertainment at the same time. And if you look at what's happening in our calendars today, then there's a classifier that's running through all our emails, and it goes, aha, here is an email about a flight reservation, but it's also about a hotel booking and a car rental and so on, and then your calendars get populated automatically with uh, this information. Okay, so the machine learning jargon for a choice in a multiple choice question is category or label. And I will be using the word label throughout my talk to refer to these choices. Right? Okay, so if you looked at the state of the art in 2012, then people were trying out all these classi different classification problems, but with only a small number of labels. Right? So over here, I've shown you some of the Microsoft products that depend on binary, multi-class, and multi-label classification. And as you can see, the number of labels in each of them is, is fairly limited. Right? So of course, in binary classification, you just have two labels. But even in multi-class and multi-label classification, people had slowly graduated from working with ten, tens of labels to hundreds and thousands of labels. And if you looked at the state of the art in 2012, then the largest publicly available data set had about 5,000 labels. And so the size of the output space was two to the power 5,000, which is quite large. And so going beyond that was considered very hard. 
Then in WWW 2013, we published a paper which exploded the number of labels being considered in multi-label classification from 5,000 to 10 million. The motivating application was to build a classifier that could automatically predict the subset of millions of Bing queries that might potentially lead to a click on a new ad. So we wanted to build a tool for advertisers such as Geico so that when they created an ad like this, they could use our tool to figure out which Bing queries might lead to a click on the ad. And then they could bid on these queries. And if their bid was high enough and the query got asked on Bing, then their ad might get shown. Now, as you can well imagine from the context of the application, predicting queries from web pages is a really important problem from both a commercial as well as a research perspective. And so many sophisticated natural language processing, information retrieval, and machine learning techniques have been developed in the literature. However, we decided to avoid all these approaches and formulated the problem by simply taking the top 10 million monetizable queries on Bing and treating each one of them as a separate label in a multi-label classifier. So we built a multi-label classifier, uh, multi-label random forest classifier called MLRF, which would take this ad as input, extract a bag of words feature vector from the raw HTML underlying the ad, and then simply classify the feature vector into the relevant subset of top 10 million monetizable Bing queries. Now this was a completely new and very different way of thinking about the problem, and as a, as a result, MLRF gave significantly higher precision and coverage as compared to the leading techniques that were in production in Bing at that point of time. So coverage went up by about 30% and precision went up by about 5%, which is fairly significant. Okay. So as I mentioned, MLRF was published in WWW 2013 and it led to the creation of a new research area in machine learning called extreme classification, which deals with multi-class and multi-label problems involving millions of labels. And since 2013, extreme classification has come to be a thriving area of research in both academia and industry. So students are now doing PhDs in the area, papers are coming out routinely every year in top tier conferences, and eight popular workshops have also been organized on the topic. And if you would like to carry out uh, research on this problem, we've maintained the extreme classification repository where we made publicly available code, data sets, metrics, papers, benchmark results, etc., which make it very easy for new researchers to come in and get started. The other thing that we've come to realize since 2013, or the other thing that's happened since 2013, is that we've come to the realization that extreme classification generalizes far beyond being a simple tool for advertisers. Okay? In fact, one of the most interesting questions to have come out of our research is when or where in the world will you ever have 10 million labels to choose from? What are the applications of extreme classification? Well, if you think about it, 10 million is a really large number. Even if it takes you just one second in order to read out a label, it will take you four months without eating and sleeping to go through a list of 10 million labels. And to just put things in perspective, when I was doing my PhD in computer vision, um, Pietro Perona and Jitendra Malik would get up and tell the computer vision community that according to Biedermann's counts, there are only 60,000 object categories in the world. So most traditional um, computer vision problems won't make the cut. Similarly, if you were to pick up an English language dictionary, you would find somewhere between 100,000 to 500,000 words, depending on which dictionary you picked up. And so many traditional uh, NLP problems might not also make the cut. Okay. Nevertheless, over the last five years, people have found certain high impact applications of extreme classification, ranging from information retrieval to recommender systems and even computer vision and NLP for that matter. So for the remainder of my talk, I'll be focusing on some of these applications and I will be switching to the language of ranking and recommendation in order to discuss them. And the way we'll be formulating these applications is that there will be a space of users X and a space of items Y. And what we'd like to do is to learn an extreme multi-label classification function F that is going to take a point in the space of users and map it to a set of, point in the, uh, set of points in the space of items so that when a user comes in, we can simply apply the classifier, see which labels get predicted, and then return the items corresponding to those labels to the user either as a recommended bag or as a ranked list depending on the application. Okay. So as you can see, extreme classification 
gives a way of reformulating ranking and recommendation problems by treating each item to be ranked or recommended as a separate label in a multi-label classifier. And to see why this can be a very powerful idea, let's look at some applications, staying with an advertising in Bing to start with. So here is an ad for selling uh, distilled water, or for buying distilled water on Amazon. And as you can see, uh, they're selling uh, Tesco's brand of distilled water and a few other brands as well. But unfortunately, the advertiser bid on just a single query, which is distilled water 5 liters. And what this implies is that this ad can only get shown if this query gets asked on the search engine. And as a result, this ad was not shown on Bing for over six months, even though it had been sitting in our inventory all along. So we would like to rectify this problem by predicting the subset of Bing queries that might lead to a click on this ad, and then taking those queries and inserting them into Bing's inverted ad index along with the ad, so that if one of those queries gets asked, then the ad can get shown automatically, even though the advertiser might have forgotten to bid on that particular query. Okay. Now, this is not a new idea. We were not the first ones to think of it. And as I was mentioning earlier, Bing has an entire ensemble of 50 top-notch algorithms based on natural language processing, information retrieval, and machine learning, whose job it is to predict queries from web pages. But unfortunately, none of them did a very good job in this particular case. Bing ads managed to predict just one query, which is water five, which is not very relevant to this particular ad. Whereas if you look at all our predictions, then they're all on the money. Uh, we predict Tesco's distilled water, uh, distilled water, whereby distilled water, distilled water delivery, distilled water Amazon, and so on. And because of our predictions, this ad has been shown uh, multiple times on the, in the UK market and got clicks as well. So let me take just a moment to reflect on why traditional approaches don't work well in this case and why extreme classification does. And the high level intuition is that a complex machine learning model trained on a lot of data might often outperform a simple one. So the reason the traditional approach doesn't work well in this case is because it's based or it, because it tries to reduce the complexity of the problem by reducing it to a simple binary classification task. So the traditional approach learns a binary classifier H, which scans every phrase present on the ad in order to predict whether that phrase would make for a good recommendation or not for as a good query. Right? Now, unfortunately, ads are pithy and have very little text on them. And therefore, the binary classifier H can never predict the query by distilled water simply because it never occurs as a phrase on the ad. Right? So the binary classifier, it's only limited to, it's limited to predicting only things that actually occur on the ad as text. Furthermore, the binary classifier is low capacity. It's simple, and yet we expect it to model millions of queries and millions of ads. And so obviously it will fail many times, and this is what you see over here when it recommends that water five would make for a good prediction. Okay. On the other hand, in extreme classification, we actually embrace the complexity of the problem by testing each ad against all 10 million queries. So we learn a hierarchy over the space of queries where we have all 10 million queries at the root node, but then all the fruit related queries will go left and all the distilled water and the engine oil uh, queries will go right. And then once you've gone right, let's say the engine oil and battery and all those other queries will go left and all the distilled water queries will go right. So that when an ad comes in, you can walk it down the tree in logarithmic time in milliseconds and accurately predict all the distilled water queries, even though they might not have occurred as text on the ad itself. Okay. So our hierarchical algorithm for extreme classification is called Parable and it was published in uh, WWW earlier this year. And Parable has a number of advantages over MLRF. So first, Parable can be up to 10,000 times faster to train. So what used to take us seven hours on a thousand core cluster to train with MLRF now takes just 17 minutes on a single core of a standard desktop. So this significantly increases the speed at which you can experiment and innovate, etc. Right? Second, Parable also reduces the model size from terabytes to gigabytes, which means that you can now train Parable on your own desktop and, and play with it. And you don't need to buy big expensive servers with a lot of RAM. And third, Parable has also improved the classification accuracy significantly. So when we started the research area in 2013, 
Then on one of the benchmark tasks, which is predicting tags for Wikipedia articles, our classification accuracy was somewhere around 19%. And today, Parable's accuracy is about 65% on that same task. Right? Okay, so you can download code for Parable from the Extreme Classification Repository or from my homepage, and you can play with it, and please give us feedback and tell us where it works, where it doesn't work, and that will help us improve it even further. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that my colleagues at Microsoft, Anil, Rahul, and Shritendra, have made a number of domain-specific contributions which make our extreme classifiers work really well in, in advertising. Right? And as a result of their contributions, our extreme classifiers have now shipped in a number of uh, products in, uh, in Bing Ads in, in almost all the international markets. And here is just a small sampling of some of the products in some of the markets where the uh, classifiers are running currently. And in each of these cases, extreme classification is ranked as the number one algorithm amongst that list of algorithms that is predicting queries from web pages. Okay. So this was an application and advertising. Let me also quick, um, consider an application and recommendation. So we went and downloaded information of about 3 million active Amazon items. And now that we, <clears throat> we are given the fact that the user is interested in buying one of these items, in this case a book on the rare wildflowers of Kentucky, what we'd like to do is to predict the other items that the user might also be interested in buying. This is the classical item to item recommendation task, which is traditionally solved using collaborative filtering based methods. But we can reformulate it as an extreme classification problem, where the input to the extreme classifier F is going to be the product description, and the labels are going to be the 3 million active Amazon items. Okay. So if you look at the results, you can see that uh, Amazon doesn't do a great job over here. It makes only three recommendations, whereas it could have predicted a lot more. Whereas if you look at our predictions, then we recommend not only whatever Amazon recommends, but also a lot more and with a lot more diversity. So in addition to what Amazon recommends, we also recommend birds of Kentucky, wildlife of Kentucky, woody plants in Kentucky, biodiversity in Kentucky, and so on. Right? So the traditional approach to pre uh, recommending items is based on collaborative filtering, where we take the ratings matrix, which is a matrix specifying which user likes which items, and we try and factor the ratings matrix as the product of two low rank matrices. Right? So one of them is a tall, skinny matrix of user traits, and the other is a short, fat matrix of item attributes. And both of these two matrices are learned from training data. And once these two matrices have been learned, then in order to determine whether to recommend bananas to the third user or not, all we need to do is to multiply the row corresponding to the third user with the column corresponding to bananas. And if the product is greater than a certain threshold, then we recommend the bananas and otherwise we don't. Okay? So that's collaborative filtering. And it turns out that collaborative filtering uh, makes this simplifying assumption that the two matrices that are being multiplied, they have to be low rank or they have to have these particular shapes. And this is a perfectly fine assumption to make when you're working at the Netflix scale or you have thousands of movies to recommend. But unfortunately, this simplifying assumption completely breaks down at our level of complexity and, might, and therefore collaborative filtering might not be a very great choice for recommending items when there are millions of items uh, are present. Okay. So, um, in extreme classification, we don't make this low rank assumption at all about the ratings matrix. And in fact, our uh, algorithm is based on a tree and um, it's uh, based on uh, doing these warm start recommendations and it's called Swift XML. And it can make recommendations very accurately and efficiently. In fact, its uh, recommendation accuracy can be more than six times that of the collaborative filtering approach. So Swift XML was published uh, in Wisdom earlier this year. And Wisdom along with WWW are the two best conferences in the world for this kind of research. And again, the code is available on, will be available on the Extreme Classification Repository on my homepage. And again, you can download, with it, uh, download it and play with it, uh, et cetera. Okay. So let me finally cover just one more application, which is somewhat similar, but this time in the area of web search. Okay. So if you go and submit a query to a, a search engine, then it will recommend related queries that you could have asked or that might have served your information needs better. Or it will recommend related queries that you could have asked in addition to get more information on the topic. Okay. So for instance, if you go to Bing and ask about CAM procedure shoulder, 
it'll recommend that you try asking about Cam Newton shoulder surgery instead. So this is known as the related searches problem. And it is traditionally solved using uh, uh, sessions-based approaches or query URL graph-based approaches, etc. But we can again reformulate it as an extreme classification problem, where this time the input to the extreme classification function f is going to be a query. And the labels are going to be the top 100 million queries on Bing. Okay. And again, if you look at the results, you can see that Bing does not do a very good uh, job over here, right? So it, Bing was able to make only one uh, recommendation, which is Cam Newton shoulder surgery. And unfortunately, it turns out that this is not a very good recommendation. So the Cam procedure that is being asked about in the original user query stands for the Comprehensive Arthroscopic Management Procedure. Whereas Bing gets confused and it, it thinks you're asking about the football player Cam Newton and the shoulder surgery that he had. Okay. So it turns out to give you a not very good recommendation. Whereas if you look at the predictions made with extreme classification, then they're uh, fairly diverse. So we ask, uh, we uh, recommend what is the cost of an arthroscopic shoulder surgery, what to wear after a shoulder surgery, how long should you take off work after a shoulder surgery, um, different types of shoulder surgery, and what will be music to the ears of the lawyers in the room, we also ask shoulder replacement lawsuits. Okay. So, <clears throat> the traditional approach to um, recommending items, uh, sorry, predicting these queries for uh, related searches is based on sessions information. Okay. So, a session is when a user comes in and types a query, uh, submits a query, such as CAM procedure shoulder, but then he doesn't like the results that he sees, so he Im immediately asks a different query, which is, let's say, cost of arthroscopic shoulder surgery, right? But unfortunately, because a query could be a tail query, like a CAM procedure shoulder um, might not get asked very frequently. In fact, if it doesn't get asked at all, then it won't be there in your sessions information and most of your sessions based algorithms will fail, which is why Bing makes so few recommendations. And then even the query similarity methods can get confused because uh, CAM Newton and the CAM shoulder, well, they sound very similar. And so it will recommend uh, Cam Newton shoulder surgery for Cam procedure shoulder. Okay. <laughs> Whereas our algorithm for extreme classification for related searches is called SLICE. And it learns a separate classifier uh, per query, per label. But it is very, very efficient. So it is able to scale to 100 million labels, which is well beyond the pale of any other classifier out there in the world today. Okay. And it does this by reducing the training and prediction cost from linear in the number of labels to logarithmic, which is why it scales uh, to such large problems. And when we uh, tried it out on Bing, it uh, gave in remarkable uh, improvements in the performance. So it was able to improve the coverage by about 50%. And uh, it, had, it increased the clicks on the tail queries by 12%. So in the tail deciles, the very, very tail, and which are the hardest to get right uh, in these kinds of problems. Okay. And where I'm ultimately going with this is that we've got, we started off with 10 million and now we've reached 100 million labels. And if we could get extreme classification to scale to billions of labels, then we could think about building the next generation of search engines based on this, on extreme classification, right? So for example, I could treat each document on the web as a separate label. And I could then learn an extreme uh, multi-label classifier. And now when a new query comes in, I'll simply apply the classifier, see which subset of documents are predicted to be relevant to that query, and then show those documents. And I can rank the documents based on the classifier probabilities. And because I'll be trained on click data, then this ranking should also hopefully be good. right? So that is uh, still a, a dream, it's a still a, uh, a, a few years ago uh, away actually. And if any of you like the sound of that project and are interested in doing a PhD with me uh, at IIT Delhi, then please come and talk to me uh, afterwards. Mm, that'd be very happy to discuss that with you. Okay, so I could discuss many other applications such as tagging on Wikipedia, person identification on Facebook, uh, language modeling, etc. But rather than going on and on, let me conclude the first part of my talk by reiterating that extreme classification is a new research area in machine learning, which not only helps us tackle web scale classification problems, but which has also opened a paradigm, new paradigm for key or critical applications in our industry, such as ranking and recommendation. 
And over the last five years, we've developed uh, many algorithms to tackle some of these algorithms, uh, to tackle some of these applications. And you can find most of these on my web page. All the papers are there and code is there. And if you go to the extreme classification repository, you can also play with the data sets and so on. Okay. So that's it for the first part of my talk. Uh, for the second part, let me shift to the other extreme of machine learning and talk about um, machine learning at the extremely small scale. Okay. So here I'll be talking about the edge of machine learning where I'll be focusing on developing machine learning algorithms that can be trained on the cloud or on your laptop, but can then be or but can then make predictions locally on tiny internet of things, edge and endpoint devices, which might have as little as two kilobytes of RAM. Okay. Uh, and this is a joint project with lots of my colleagues at uh, Microsoft. So uh, because some of you might not be very familiar with the Internet of Things, let me start by uh, discussing the hardware that we plan to target. So here is an ARM Cortex uh, M0 Plus microcontroller. It has only two kilobytes of RAM, 32 kilobytes of read-only flash, and it has no support in hardware for floating point operations. And it's incredibly energy efficient because it operates at only 35 microamperes per uh, megahertz. And as a result, it's incredibly tiny. It's tinier than a grain of rice. And the object that you see on the background over there for size comparisons is a golf ball. In fact, I have some of them here with me. I don't know whether you'll be able to see them. So I have them in this plastic box over here. And uh, there are a couple of them over, but I don't know whether you can see them. Sarita, I don't know if you want to hand this around and then I'll take it back from you after the talk. So this is an Arduino Uno board. It is built around an 8-bit Atmel Atmega 328P microcontroller running at 16, mega, 16 megahertz. And it also has only 2 kilobytes of RAM, 32 kilobytes of flash, and no support in hardware for floating point operations. So the way these um, IoT microcontrollers work is that once you've trained your machine learning model in the cloud or on your laptop, you, you then take the machine learning model, the prediction code, the feature extraction code, uh, data parameters, etc., and you burn all of that onto the flash of the microcontroller along with the bootloader, the device drivers, the libraries, and any application code that you might have, and then you deploy it in the field. At which point of time, the flash memory becomes read-only, and the only writable memory that you have access to is the two kilobytes of RAM. Okay. Now, billions of uh, microcontrollers, of such microcontrollers, have already been deployed in the world, and, and they're being deployed every year. And so there is a Internet of Things wave that is riding on the backs of these tiny microcontrollers that is all set to revolutionize our world. However, it's still early days, and people aren't really quite sure of which application will take off and what will be the next big thing. So they're trying out lots of different applications in connected cars, predictive maintenance, industrial IoT, smart cities, smart housing, smart appliances, and so on. But the one thing that is common to all these applications is the assumption that the IoT device is dumb. It just senses its environment and then transmits the sensor readings to the cloud where all the intelligence resides and where all the decision making happens. Okay. However, we believe that there are a number of critical scenarios where it might not be feasible to transmit the data to the cloud and whether IoT device itself needs to be made intelligent in order to enable decision making to happen locally. Okay. Now these scenarios typically arise due to concerns about latency, um, bandwidth and connectivity, privacy and security and energy. And they can range from these um, uh, scenarios where we want to implant microcontrollers into the brains, brains of patients who suffer from seizures so that um, we can predict and seizure is about to happen and then they can call for help immediately. So for example, if they're driving, then they can pull over or if they're swimming, then they can get out of the pool and call for a caregiver, etc. And they range from the, these low latency scenarios to prediction uh, to precision agriculture on disconnected farms, to privacy preserving smart glasses, and also to this incredibly energy efficient but hilarious smart folk which starts shouting at you if you eat too much or eat too quickly. Okay. So a bunch of us at uh, Microsoft Research India decided to come together to address uh, some of these concerns. 
And uh, our objective is to build a library of very efficient machine learning algorithms, right? And let me be absolutely clear about the scenario. The machine learning algorithms or the library that we want to build, these algorithms will be trained in the cloud or the laptop where we assume that there are infinite resources available for training. Though practically our algorithms turn out to be reasonably efficient. But once the algorithms have been trained and the models have been trained, then the models need to be squeezed onto the flash of these tiny microcontrollers where they're expected to fit in a few kilobytes, make predictions in milliseconds even on these slow microcontrollers, and make sure that batteries last forever and ever. Okay. So we've released the uh, Microsoft Edge machine learning library on GitHub. And as part of this library, we, uh, we've released two algorithms, uh, Bonsai and uh, Proton. And they were both published at ICML last year. So ICML along with NIPS is the premier conference on machine learning. And um, the first algorithm is Bonsai, and this is a tree-based model, which is very highly compact. It just learns a single tree, which is very shallow, depth three, depth four in most cases. And we also have a compressed k-nearest neighbor uh, algorithm called Proton, and both of them are very efficient. And I won't go into technical details because that might not be suitable for this uh, audience, but let me just um, show you some of the results to see what we can achieve with Bonsai and Proton. Okay. So we benchmark Bonza and Proton on a number of uh, benchmark machine learning tasks as well as IoT tasks. And in the first experiment that we carried out, we wanted to see or compare Bonza and Proton's performance using very tiny models, so just 2 kilobytes and 16, 16 kilobytes, to the performance of state-of-the-art uncompressed methods that are running in the cloud which have no constraints on the resources they can use, right? So they have as much prediction time as they need, as much memory as they need, as much energy consumption as they require, et cetera, right? And these methods include gradient boosted decision tree ensembles, RBF SVMs, k na neighbor classifiers, and neural nets with a single hidden layer, okay? Now, because there are a lot of numbers to report over here, in order to avoid confusion, I will first always show Bonsai's bar in red, and then Proton's bar in blue, and then all the other algorithms afterwards. So what you can see in this experiment is that there can actually be cases where Bonsai and Proton with very tiny models can actually outperform these state-of-the-art classifiers running in the cloud. Okay. So the first data set or the first task is of detecting uh, right whales in the ocean uh, from sonar uh, signals. And it turns out that the best uncompressed cloud-based method uh, is a gradient boosted decision tree ensemble for this particular task. And if you look at the numbers, then Bonsai's prediction accuracies can actually be 5% higher than the gradient boosted decision tree ensembles. And Proton can be about 3% higher while Bonsai's model is 900 times smaller than the uh, gradient booster decision tree ensemble, the GBDT ensemble. And Bonsai is 300 times small, uh, Proton is 300 times smaller, I'm sorry. And the trend is also the same on the two character recognition in the wild data sets, the, both the binary version and the multi-class version. But I think these kinds of results we'll only see once in a blue moon, right? In your typical IoT scenario, I think what we will much more, what we are much more likely to see are the results on the last data set. So that is the Berkeley Variable Activity Recognition data set or WARD. And over here, it again turns out that by some stroke of luck that the best uh, cloud-based classifier over here is the gradient boosted decision tree ensemble. But now Bonsai's classification accuracy is just 1% lower than uh, the GBDT ensemble. Uh, Proton is 2% lower. But both Bonsai and Proton have models that are 75 times smaller. Yeah. So what these experiments show is that Bonsai and Proton are uh, reasonably good classifiers. They can reach prediction accuracies that are almost matching the state of the arts, but with much smaller models. Okay. Then in the second experiment, we actually implemented some of these algorithms on the Arduino Uno, and we compared their uh, uh, prediction costs when the model was limited to being no larger than two kilobytes. Now in this case, you can see that uh, Bonsai and Proton's classification accuracy is much higher than all of the other methods. Uh, please ignore the cloud GBDT bar because that's still the gradient boosted decision tree ensemble running in the cloud, and I'll come to that experiment in a while. But if you ignore that bar, you can see that now, Bonsai and Proton have much higher accuracy when you want to do prediction locally on the device. And at the same time, 
their prediction costs are much lower. So they can make predictions in a few milliseconds per test point using a few millijoules. Okay. The cloud GBDT bar that I mentioned is to check what happens if we actually do have bandwidth and connectivity and we can send the uh, features to the cloud and run a, a gradient booster decision tree ensemble or the best classifier over there. Right? So in this case, if you can afford to do that, then your accuracies will be much higher. They can match bonds and protons. Sometimes they can be higher than that also by a percent or so. But now your prediction costs in terms of the prediction time and prediction energy can be 200 to 1000 times more. Right? So this clearly demonstrates that it's far better to do predictions locally on the device rather than using bonsai and proton rather than using any other algorithm or trying to send the data to the cloud. Okay. Then in our third experiment, we compared bonsai and proton's performance to all the state-of-the-art methods that have been developed for resource-efficient machine learning. Right. So for, that can make predictions quickly or on a tiny budget, etc. So Bonsai is a tree-based method, so we compared it to gradient boosted decision tree ensembles, as well as the best technique for pruning these ensembles, uh, from, uh, which is called tree pruning. And we also com compared Bonsai to decision jungles, uh, which is a technique from MSR Cambridge uh, that is running in many applications. And also to the best techniques from academia, which are uh, feature budgeted random forests and pruned random forests. And Proton is a nearest neighbor algorithm, so we compared it to uh, SNC, which is the leading technique for compressing nearest neighbor classifiers. And we also had local deep kernel learning and deep compression uh, from Songhan and Bill Daly's group over there, right? So all of these methods that I just listed, they have a knob uh, in them. And if you turn the knob, then they, these methods can generate models of different uh, sizes, right? So what I'm doing is I'm turning the knob on the x-axis between 0 kilobytes to 128 kilobytes. And then on the y-axis, I'm plotting the classification accuracy for that particular model. And as you can see, Bonsai and Proton dominate all the other algorithms. In fact, the classification difference, the gap, the performance gap between Bonsai and the next best method in the binary uh, classification case can be as much as 6%. And in the multi-class classification case can be almost 30%. Right? And this is true for almost all the data sets. Uh, um, the trends hold uh, in general. And Bonsai and Proton will dominate all the other curves. And this reveals that uh, if you're interested in these very tiny memory regimes, then Bonsai and Proton might be the best algorithms uh, for these particular uh, choices. Then finally, we wanted to show that Bonsai and Proton generalize beyond the IoT scenario to other resource constraint scenarios as well. So we looked at the task of uh, L3 ranking on Bing. And over here, the ranker has to op operate under very tight service level agreements. So what I'm showing you on this graph is the performance of uh, one of the best rankers uh, for this task. It's called FastRank. It was developed by Ofedekel and Chris Burgess. And Chris won a Test of Time award at ICML a couple of years ago for this, a few years ago. And the interesting thing to note is that Bonsai can get almost the same ranking accuracy as FastRank. Uh, actually, almost uh, very. there's almost no difference. But with a model that is 700 times smaller. Right? So you can get a model like in about 300 bytes. And then you can fit it into L1 cache and can run very efficiently and so on. OK, so to conclude, I just wanted to uh, leave you with a couple of take home messages. Uh, the first is that machine learning for the Internet of Things can provide many high impact opportunities for uh, transforming our society. And so based on this observation, we are building the edge machine learning library that you can now download from GitHub. It's under an MIT license, so you can do whatever you like with it. And as part of the library, we have released two algorithms, Bonsai and Proton which are fast, accurate, compact, and, and very energy efficient. And we're also working on a library for a, a, an algorithm for a recurrent neural network. And at some point of time, that should also be added to the HML library. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. And thanks for listening.